question everything. Why, you ask? Good question. Because questions inspire us. They inform us. They define us. The Walker was founded on a question. Shall we take it? Should Minneapolis accept a public center for the arts? The answer, yes. A resounding yes. An answer that ignited a litany of questions. 75 years of questions, in fact. Questions about beauty, destruction, perception, reality, conflict, joy. Questions like, what does it mean to be more than a museum? What is an art center? What if we reached beyond our walls? Does a museum need walls? Is it possible to create a safe place for unsafe ideas? What if we created a place that truly gave artists a voice? Let them ask us questions, all of us. Questions like, what are the possibilities? How do we resist, struggle, come together? What of this discussion, conflict, debate is beneficial? So there's lots of questions. But why all of these questions? To what end, you ask? We see it like this. One question sparks another question, and another question, and finally, a conversation. That's been the point of all this for 75 years. Conversations that inspire us, that challenge us. Conversations that make us stop and think. Conversations that make us feel and bring us together. Are we proud of the last 75 years? No question. But we're far more proud of how the questions we've asked have informed us, enlightened us, and inspired us, all of us, as artists, as audiences, as a community. If 75 years has taught us anything, it's question everything. to start. I'd like to begin by welcoming everybody tonight to this talk and acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and waters we meet upon, the Gadigal people of the Ora Nation. It gives me great pleasure to be welcoming Olga Visa to the Museum of Contemporary Art for the first time. She's both a friend and a colleague and we have spent many delightful hours discussing and debating and questioning the issues around art. Her presentation tonight is in association with the University of New South Wales Art and Design headed up by Professor Ross Harley, who I'd also like to welcome. He'll be leading a Q&A after Olga's talk, so you'll get plenty of chances to ask questions. Olga Viso became Executive Director of the Walker Art Centre in Minneapolis in January 2008 after 12 years at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., where she began as a curator of contemporary art and rose to director. At the Walker, Olga oversees innovative artistic programming across the disciplines, including visual arts and design, performing arts, film and video. During her tenure, the Walker has sought to fuel artistic dialogue across mediums, as well as actively engage the community both within museum walls and beyond. Olga is known for her scholarship in contemporary Latin American art and the work of the late performance-based artist Ana Mendieta. Recent curatorial projects include a major survey of contemporary American sculptor Jim Hodges, which she co-curated with Jeffrey Grove at the Dallas Museum of Art. And I note in his wonderful book that Olga has brought that he was actually in an exhibition called MCA Unpacked in 2008. At the Hirshhorn, she organized or co-organized significant, significant exhibitions of leading artists, including Robert Gober, Guillermo Cuica, Anna Mendieta, and Juan Munoz. She's currently on the board of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts New York and has been a trustee at the American Association of Museum Directors. In 2013, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve on the National Council on the Arts. Olga was born in Florida to Cuban emigre parents, received a BA from Rollins College and her master's degree in art history from Emory University in Atlanta. Please join me in welcoming Olga Wiesel.
So lovely to be here with you tonight. And uh, thank you for the warm welcome. And Lizanne, thank you um, so much for the invitation to speak here um, at the MCA. Um, Lizanne is um, a friend and a colleague and uh, someone um, who I very much admire as an adventurous thinker who's focused on the future of institutions. And in fact, a couple of years ago, I invited her to come and participate in a convening of museum directors at the Aspen Institute to talk about you know, the future of art museums in particular. And also, I want to acknowledge Gary Sangster from the University of New South Wales Art and Design School. Gary's an old friend um, from the beginning of my career uh, in Baltimore, Washington days when he lived in the States. And Gary also ran a wonderful experimental space called the Contemporary Baltimore uh, that was, I, I would say, very much a kind of early example of uh, kind of non-institutional, um, uh, non-traditional um, um, museum and educational practice. So I, I learned a lot by watching your experiments uh, back in the 90s. So great to be here, and really great to be a guest of the university. And I want to thank Dean Ross Harley um, for the opportunity to be here. It's um, still winter in Minneapolis, so um, it's lovely <laughs> to be here in a much warmer climate, and I hope to go back uh, into spring. And thank you for indulging me and in sort of sharing that video that uh, we opened this conversation and this um, lecture with. Uh, it's a video that we just produced called Question Everything uh, in conjunction with our 75th anniversary as a public art center, which we are celebrating this year in 2015. And I think I wanted to share it because I think it really encapsulates uh, so well um, what the Walker is about and the kind of institution it is as a multidisciplinary art center. Um, that is really more than a museum and brings together um, a variety of artistic disciplines together under one roof. A uh, visual arts program in the, in the form of a museum, a performing arts program, moving image program, and also design and architecture. And uh, it's through really these disciplines that we enact our mission um, as an institution, which is to be a catalytic platform for artists and audiences. And it, it is uh, very much embedded um, in our mission statement, which I'm showing you here, which is really not the usual mission statement that you see um, for institutions and certainly for most museums, uh, which um, really call out collecting the, you know, the acquisition of art, the preservation of art, the presentation of art, the engagement with audiences um, and interpretation as really the core activities and function of the institution. And it's not that the Walker doesn't do that, and it's not that we don't enact those functions um, in the, certainly the museum part of the program, but the Walker's mission statement, I think, is really much broader and, and more expansive um, and active in terms of the agency that I think um, it describes for artists and for audiences. And I think it very much shapes our focus um, on supporting new art forms uh, and new art. And it defines, I think, a very artist-centric institution because we are trying to catalyze the creative expressions of artists in whatever forms that takes. But I think it also defines an institution um, that puts audiences very much at the center of that research and that inquiry and that speculation um, about the art of our time. And again, to quote our mission statement, that really um, questions, um, you know, the, the, it's the questions that inform us and the questions that shape and inspire us as individuals and cultures and communities, both locally and globally, is so much a part of who we are, that, that, that act of questioning. And when I first came to the Walker in 2008, I was very struck by, I think, the boldness and agency of this mission statement, which was uh, kind of revised or rewritten in the 1990s um, by my predecessor, Kathy Halbreich, um, because I think it really positions the institution as this catalytic, inquiry-based um, platform for investigation that is really more about asking questions than it is about providing answers to questions. And so I think it's, for me, it's a mission statement that really continues to inspire me every day. And I would say that our staff really lives and breathes at every level. It really uh, informs um, the institution. And I think um, it's one that I think many museums have been increasingly looking to because it, it moves museums from that maybe more passive um, kind of educational, presentational model to much more of an active, relational, conversational, dialogue-based platform um, that is very much a topic of discussion, you know, um, with, within institutions and certainly talking about, um, you know, how we activate that creative agency for both our artists that we work with and the audiences that we engage is something that Lizanne and, and Gary certainly um, kind of urged me to talk about. So as the Walker celebrates its 75th anniversary, and we are um, 
celebrating that this year. We've tried to get in touch with the, those values that I think have made us the, the kind of institution that we are. And I'm going to share a little bit with, of that history with you tonight because I think it's a really fascinating and unusual history that dates back to the 1930s and to Depression era US and some very progressive kind of governmental support of the arts um, in that period. We're an art center that came out of the art center movement in America uh, in, the, in the 1930s. And I think it, it not only uh, kind of underscores the values or underpins the institution that we are today, but I think it's also um, underscores and underpins the direction that we're uh, increasingly moving um, as an institution today, which is really from a multidisciplinary platform, and these are the three program areas, and we have three you know, different formal spaces, the galleries, the, the theater um, stage, and, and the cinema. But we are moving, I would say, increasingly to being um, a much more interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. The terms are highly debated and evolving, and I think for us as an institution, it's important to be at the center of those discussions. Um, and I think as an institution that really seeks to blur those boundaries artistically and curatorially and invites both artists and audiences to move fluidly across these different artistic platforms, whether it's the stage, it's the galleries, it's the cinema, it's public space, um, even virtual space. So what we are really you know, trying to advance, and I would say I'm trying to advance institutionally, is um, a vision of the Walker that is a much more supple and creative platform for both artists and audiences um, to experiment. And I'm just showing a you a few of um, recent experiments or examples of projects in which we've invited choreographers to work in our museum spaces. Ralph Lemon, Tricia Brown are invited filmmakers to collaborate and present projects on our theater stage. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those cross-disciplinary programmatic um, initiatives where we're, I think, seeking to be you know, less um, maybe hierarchical and formal in the different disciplinary areas that our institution supports and represents. Um, and talk a little bit how that's not only shaping the kind of programming that we do, but how it's also really beginning to um, shape uh, the character of our collections, because we are a collecting institution, in really um, new ways. Um, and I think we've begun to increasingly collect between the cracks, uh, between the disciplines, with new vigor. It's something we've kind of always done, but I would say we're doing with greater focus um, and greater intent. And particularly since we acquired, um, about three years ago, the Merce Cunningham Dance Archive. 3,000 um, objects, um, set designs, decors, props, costumes um, that focus on the collaborations that Merce Cunningham, one of the great choreographers you know, of the, the last um, uh, 50, 60 years, um, collaborated with so many visual artists throughout his careers. And so it's a, an incredible archive that was a real um, uh, kind of foundational um, acquisition for us that I think is allowing us to tell very different stories about the history of 20th century art and 20th century visual art. And in, in the case of certain artists, and give you an example of a recent uh, research exhibition that we did um, around um, Robert Rauschenberg. And when you look at Robert Rauschenberg's production, not just as a painter, but as an artistic collaborator, uh, who worked with choreographer like Merce Cunningham. Um, he was the artistic director for Merce Cunningham Dance Company for almost a decade. Um, you start um, and collaborated with John Cage and, and so many other innovators in that artistic circle. I think it begins to tell a rich um, story of how art is generated and produced through um, response to other artists and influences and comes out of a, a you know, much more um, collaborative artistic milieu. And so I'm showing you some of examples of the props, sets, drops, and costumes that came from that collection from a variety of productions from Merce Cunningham from the 50s um, onward. And, and, when, and in this exhibition, we brought it together with paintings in the Walker's collection um, that uh, have come into the collection since the 60s and 70s. And I think really begin to tell a different story um, about um, really the the uh, development of Bob Rauschenberg's painting. When you see so the early combat paintings, not just within the tradition of painting and pioneering approaches to painting and, and painting and sculpture, um, but that you understand that those were um, actual set pieces um, that Merce Cunningham performed around, the early combine from a stage set from Minutia. So you start to reveal and tell a different um, history and even look at the history of painting in a new way through that, through that broader lens. And so I think the potentiality of this 
collection um, is something that um, I think is being is very foundational for us, and it's informed other um, acquisitions that. Um, we have made um, just in the last several years, um, looking at the intersection and relationships between visual artists and choreographers, but those um, who've also moved fluidly from performance to object making, like Trisha Brown um, or Ralph Lemon, um, so I'm showing you, or Meredith Monk, um, some recent acquisitions. Um, so it's been a, a recent focus of our collecting, um, looking at artists who move, again, very fluidly across platforms and engaging with them in conversations about what aspects of the work or these productions um, translate into the museum context, what's important to archive, what is archive, what's ephemera, what are independent objects, uh, um, how do we preserve and, and document these works beyond just do, you know, video, video, videographic documentation of live performance and what's appropriate to just acknowledge that is just live performance and, and lives just in, in that, that lived experience. So we've been inviting many of these artists to engage with us in the research and collecting practices of the institution, which is something I think has been very um, exciting work that um, we've begun. And just to say that coming in the next several years, uh, we'll be um, putting together an exhibition that looks at Merce Cunningham and his collaborators in a major show that will travel, um, that will look at, at these collaborative relations that Merce had with um, artists of his generation, but also many younger artists, and how Merce's practice and way of collaborating across platform continues to be an inspiration to so many artists um, working today. So just to back up a little bit, just if you're not familiar with um, the Walker Art Center, um, this is a picture of the Walker and we expanded 10 years ago um, and this is a Herzog and Demeron sort of side of the of the Walker campus. We are situated right in downtown Minneapolis, um, kind of right on the edge of downtown looking um, towards the skyline and we have a 16 acre campus that encompasses the Walker itself, the Herzog building, an earlier 1971 building uh, and then it's situated across an uh, 11 acre sculpture park the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden, which we manage uh, with the city. It's parkland, um, city parkland that we program and we provide the, the art for. It's a sculpture garden that opened in 1988. So it's got a wonderful campus um, that uh, overlooks, um, the, the, the museum overlooks this amazing um, park that's a very beloved destination in the Twin Cities. And for, for us as a contemporary art institution that often presents more experimental and challenging work, it offers a, a gateway um, for audiences and broader audiences to um, engage with the institution um, and um, engage with different aspects of the institution. It's a really kind of wonderful kind of outward face um, for the walker in, in our community. Um, we have um, a multidisciplinary program, uh, and to just share the, the different spaces, we have um, 40,000 square feet of gallery space uh, where we do eight to 10 exhibitions a year. 90% of our collection is art after 1960, so it's a very strong contemporary um, focus. Um, our performing arts theater is a 385 seat theater. We do 20 to 25 productions a year of new music, theater, and dance. Many of it commissions of, of new, new productions that we support uh, the commissioning. And uh, a, a 370 seat cinema where we screen about 150 films a year. Uh, mostly independent film, very global um, program, very premieres based, um, and again focused on you know new work. And we're often premiering films in our region and sometimes even um, uh, in the country. We really pride ourselves on being an artist centric institution uh, that really supports artists um, at the beginnings of their careers, but also continues to support them throughout their careers. And we have a deep history with Merce Cunningham that actually dates back to the 50s. He'd been to the Walker 16 times you know, in, in his long career before he passed away in 2009. Artists like Chuck Close, who's uh, right on view here right now um, at the MCA. The Walker was the first institution to purchase his, a painting in 1967. Uh, and he's had a long history with the institution through that early support. And it sort of speaks to how the, the kind of relationships that we build with artists across disciplinary boundaries um, and again really defines who we are and comes right out of our mission statement. Our program really um, aspires to be very global in its reach and, and also the kind of media 
uh, that, that we explore. And these are just some recent um, projects that we've done or acquisitions that we've made from artists based in Korea and Cairo uh, in Buenos Aires. And we, uh, we often work uh, to, to give artists sometimes the very first solo museum shows or to um, be the first exposure of the work in, to US audiences um, through, through our gallery platform. We really are an art center that's committed to um, new art and scholarship uh, and to really experimenting across platform, whether that's on the stage, in the galleries, online. We, we really support commissioning um, new work. But we also are a collecting institution. So we are a museum with a permanent collection. And uh, the Walker in the 75 years has built a collection of about 13,000 objects. And we also consider our collection to encompass not just um, our visual arts permanent collection, but a really amazing film archive, um, uh, experimental film from the 60s and 70s is a very strong concentration. Uh, commissions, we were early sort of um, pioneers in commissioning artists to make works online. Uh, that's considered, again, one of our collections, one of the special collections. Our performing arts commissions, we consider also um, uh, part of our collection and uh, the documentation of those. And uh, we've collected artists' books, and we have a very extensive archive um, and history. And so we've been, and I would urge you to go online um, if you have a chance. We have been part of a collaboration of institutions supported by the Getty that have been looking to put their collections online and find new ways of sharing collections. I know you've done a lot of work um, recently uh, at the MCA here with, with sharing the collections. And so we have now created a publishing platform beyond just cataloging our collection where we uh, commission essays to look at different aspects of our collecting that really parallel what the exhibition work that we're doing and the cross-disciplinary investigations that we are doing um, with our collection. So we have, we've published volume two very recently and this is an ongoing publication platform um, of the collection. So as I said, we're celebrating our 75th anniversary, and I'm showing you very, a 19, the 1940 version um, of the Walker Art Center. And in 1940, we became the Walker Art Center, supported by uh, the Works Progress Administration, but we're actually a much older institution. We actually go back to the 1870s. Uh, it was a private collector who opened up his home to the citizens of Minneapolis. Um, it was a very young new city just west uh, of the Mississippi. It was the first free public art gallery west of the, of the Mississippi. And uh, he was a, a very typical 19th century co um, collector uh, who opened up his home and then built um, a, 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 an art gallery that was Mr. Walker's art gallery in this Moorish facade building from 1927. He died a year later and his, his children continued to keep uh, the galleries open um, until the late 1930s um, when the Works Progress Administration, which was part of the New Deal and a kind of post-Depression era period in the U.S. where the federal government really sought to put um, all the U.S. citizens back to work but put, put, put a lot of support to supporting um, the creative fields and to employ artists to teach um, and, um, uh, and a whole museum movement of opening art centers across the country. So the Walker opened and reopened in 1940 using Mr. Walker's foundational collection as a platform, but began to commission um, artists uh, to teach um, and to produce murals and projects all over the city. We began to host performances and film screenings that have been, in many ways, explain why we're the kind of multidisciplinary institution that we are, because we were conceived to be this meeting place for all the arts in a community where many, many institutions that are now independent institutions hadn't, weren't really there in a, in a kind of a young um, American city. So that has very much shaped you know, why we are the kind of um, platform um, that we are. And just to say that um, uh, in the US, there's only a handful of institutions that really have those, those different platforms, uh, programmatic platforms um, in under one roof. And our peers from that standpoint is truly being art centers that have performing arts programs, cinema programs, are the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Wexner Center, which is um, um, one of the longer standing programs um, like, like ours, um, and Mass MoCA, which also has, um, uh, in um, Massachusetts, which has uh, a more uh, cross-disciplinary kind of platform. 
And um, you know, certainly um, outside of the U.S., uh, ZKM and Karlsruhe is, has more, much more of a media focus, but is an interesting multidisciplinary model. Pompidou um, is a, a kind of parallel institution. The new M Plus that is you know, happening in Hong Kong is very much trying to emulate the same multidisciplinary platform that defines the walker. And certainly Car Carriage Works here, its performing arts program is very parallel to our performing arts program. To give you a sense, many artists who are presenting here this year are presenting at the walker this year. Difference being that Carriage Works is not a collecting institution, but a space that brings many, many disciplines together. In terms of the museums, these are institutions that we often collaborate with that um, in the US, that uh, including my former institution, the, the Hirshhorn <coughs> Museum. So the museum part of the program um, intersects with those and, and these institutions, and I would say we're very much like the, the MCA <laughs> in terms of our programmatic focus and priorities and how we, we, want, we share what we do with, with, with our audiences. And it, what's interesting to see is how many institutions, whether it's MoMA, it's the Tate, and even New Whitney that's about to open has really bolstered its performing arts programs, has hired performing arts curators, and many, many of these institutions are um, kind of trying to activate their spaces in ways that are much more cross-disciplinary um, in practice and starting to approach more the model of what in many ways the Walker has, has always been about. Just to give you a sense of you know, what, our, what our program is, um, in the museum I mentioned we do eight to ten exhibitions um, a year. Uh, and those exhibitions range from uh, being kind of broader mid-career surveys of interesting artists from around the world. Uh, we just finished touring the survey of Mexico City-based artist Abraham Cruz Viegas um, that traveled to Mexico as well as to Germany. And we, we do have a very active tour program of um, sending our shows on the road. Lizanne mentioned the Jim Hodges exhibition, which was the first comprehensive survey of this American sculptor's work that we organized with the Dallas Museum and then toured to Los Angeles um, and to Boston. But we all, what we really um, uh, take great pride in doing is giving um, artists their first solo shows and giving uh, them op opportunities to create site-specific works very responsive. Um, in this case, to the Walker's anniversary, this is a show that's currently on. Liz Deschen is a Brooklyn-based photographer um, who has responded very much to the exhibition and um, presentation platforms of the Walker in its um, 1971 galleries. Upcoming shows with Lee Kit. Um, Lee Kit is a, an artist based in, in Taiwan uh, who works in video and painting and sculpture, very installation-based artist who will be doing um, a new project um, an installation, site-specific installation, as well as this, a piece that we brought into the collection, the, this um, video piece that recently um, entered the collection, and uh, first museum to acquire um, this young artist's work. Uh, we, we've worked with Minnick Lim, and I would say we're kind of working in ways, too, in which um, we're asking, inviting artists to work in our spaces to design not only, in, in this case, she works in video and sculpture, but to also, um, she's very interested in activating the space with um, performances. Um, and so we worked with local choreographers to um, help her develop a more performative aspect to um, her installation. Upcoming projects with German artist Andrea Butner, which will also have a museum component, but also a much more performative um, component. And then we, we do um, sort of broader uh, exhibitions, um, global surveys that look at particular trends in contemporary art. This is a recent show called Nine Artists, um, curated by one of our young curators, Bartholomew Ryan, uh, that brought together artists, a range of interesting artists from around the world who are all questioning um, the kind of modalities of the institution and how artists are framed in society and in culture and in, in, in the art world more broadly. A really kind of wonderful investigation where the curator was very much a partner with the artists and thinking about you know, how contemporary art gets presented and how artists are framed and positioned, particularly early in their careers. Or more historical um, surveys, which for us means you know, going back to the 60s, um, a show that we brought to the Walker from the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston that looked at uh, black performance in, in contemporary art in, in America, looking at um, Af African-American artists from the 60s um, to the present. Um, artists who work in performative ways but present their works in, in museum context. 
Um, so through the lens of visual arts, um, but artists who've often started their careers either working on the stage or doing street performance or working in non-traditional venues. Um, so really kind of interesting re-examination of a, a, a kind of inter intergenerational group of artists whose works have not been well documented and researched and presented or collected in Amer American institutions. And we're get, just getting ready to open just a month from now. Um, a major global survey, um, International Pop. I know you just had pop and popisms here. And uh, Wayne, uh, the curator of the show here at the Art Gallery, uh, uh, is in close dialogue with our curators. This is an expansive show that looks at the early formation of pop, so, and pop as a global phenomenon. Um, and so looking at different centers where pop emerged from the late 50s to the early 70s in Tokyo, uh, in Argentina, in Sao Paulo, in Rio, um, and in Eastern Europe. So a, a show that really, a very highly researched scholarly project that really um, kind of resets our understanding of pop and its emergence and how it was disseminated and, and exchanged among artists um, and was a real global movement and a global zeitgeist. Um, uh, kind of, so again, a kind of rethinking of pop that is part of this larger interest in pop um, around the world and its different manifestations. In our performing arts program, um, again, we do about 20 productions a year, a uh, very global scope of, of program. Uh, dance is a very strong component uh, in our program, and we look at choreographers from all over, over the world. This is a Japanese uh, movement artist but also a lot of interdisciplinary work, um, uh, particularly in the theater um, program. Uh, choreographer uh, Jerome Bell's recent um, project was on our stages, but also we look back um, um, to important figures that have had a, a, a deep relationship with the history of the walker, such as choreographer Lucinda Childs. But it's a program that's very focused on commissioning new work, and so I'm showing you some new commissions. We have an upcoming um, project with Sarah Mitchelson. We often co-produce these with uh, other performing arts organizations and are part of a larger performing arts network that is about uh, supporting um, new experimental works on stage. And some of these are commissions that will be done in tandem with the Merce Cunningham exhibition, so inviting artists who are, who, for whom Merce Cunningham was and continues to be a strong foundation are being asked to reflect on Merce's practice and um, his work f through a more you know, present lens. In our cinema program, um, as, as I mentioned, it's very focused on premieres and presenting um, kind of the latest new films, uh, very strong um, independent film focus and a strong focus on social documentary. We also partner with the University of Minnesota to organize series that looks at filmmaking in particular parts of the world. And we did a series on Iran a few years back um, and a more recent um, series that looks at the history of filmmaking in China over the last 60 years. And many of the films, we bring many of the directors, that's a kind of core part of the, the, the program, and also invite many scholars at the University of Minnesota to, to help us introduce the films and to give context to the films. I mentioned the film collection, which is a, a, a strong uh, kind of foundation. We're not just presenting film, but we also collect film um, and have been increasingly presenting uh, those film works and, and experimenting with presenting them in more of an exhibition um, context, which becomes a way for us to preserve those films and to work with those artists or estates um, to think about new platforms for um, presenting those, those films. And we've been very actively commissioning artists. We're about to launch a series of commissions, uh, some of them online only, um, inviting artists to respond to different filmmakers' works. So Maura Davey and James Richards have been invited to uh, kind of, uh, investigate the Derek Jarman films in, in our collection and are producing um, short films. And, uh, in, and in some cases, they will exist only online. And we've, we've started to experiment more with inviting filmmakers um, to create things specifically for the web. And a few years ago, um, we invited a Pichapong or a Sethakul to make um, a short film um, on the Walker Channel that was available for a limited time. And so you know, many institutions struggle with how do you translate existing works and show them online, which are all kinds of rights issues. But 
I think increasingly inviting artists to actually create works on that platform, I think is an interesting way to extend cur curatorial practice and collecting in new ways. But to share where I think um, I'm very excited about what we can do as an institution that is, has all these artistic disciplines is to really invite artists to work with the Walker as a creative platform across different media and across these programmatic areas. And so we often invite artists to do year-long residencies with us to use the, the Walker as a, as a platform with not necessarily any expectation that it be an exhibition. It can be, or it can turn into a, a different project. And I think one of the most successful um, and interesting um, projects that we did a few years ago was a residency with the um, South Korean artist Hae Yu Yang, who you may know her work. She was in Documenta, um, the last Documenta, on uh, Kwanji Biennial and works um, in an installation-based way, um, often with light, with sound, very experiential kinds of um, environments where she um, you know, re repositions um, existing found objects in ways that are about um, one's sensory experience. And I'm showing you an installation from the Walker's um, exhibition. Um, but during the year that she was there, she did. A, we invited her to help, uh, to, well, we invited her to work across platforms. And we, of course, as a, the curators, were focused on inviting her to, walk acro to work across visual arts, performing arts, film. But she was much more interested in working across the whole institution, uh, hanging out with our graphic designers and talking about their working processes and practices. Um, more interested in you know working with our installation crew and how they design exhibition furniture. And so she not only um, worked on her exhibition and also wanted to experiment with making a stage production. She'd never created something for the theater and we were going to help her with that. She organized uh, a series of workshops, a learning community that took place for a period of months um, that uh, was a kind of skill-sharing workshop. So she invited people across the staff, across the community of the Twin Cities to each take turns in leading different workshops that would then feed her installation and research process. And so um, here she is above talking to um, our head of exhibitions, our installation um, manager who oversees all the exhibitions in the galleries to talk about you know, how, they, they, how they produce work in the workshop. And she also connected with a group of um, knitters who come, would come to the walker in the summer evenings and hang out in our outdoor space <laughs> and um, you know, do a, a skill sharing workshop with, with, with her. So I think an amazing project that, and I think the way that we like to work in inviting artists to think expansively about the institution, oftentimes more expansively than uh, we might ourselves work within our own disciplinary boundaries. So, you know, here we are wanting to work across the curatorial areas, and she sees, you know, the entire institution as this in incredible research platform, which we were very happy to provide. Um, and she did um, workshop um, a piece for a stage, which she premiered at the Kwanji Biennial several years ago. And so it's that aspect of the walkers being, again, this catalytic or generative space that can be a platform for artists to generate new work, to stretch their practices, but also it, it pushes the institution to stretch, I think, in really important and interesting ways that I think it is, is important in, in advancing um, culture. And so um, over the last several years, and certainly since I've been in the Walker, we've been really focusing institutionally on maximizing the Walker's unique multidisciplinary platform, and I would say moving from being more multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary, and again, uh, wanting to um, invite artists to work across platforms increasingly because that's, I think, a unique thing we can offer. And so our curatorial teams work in new ways together. Uh, and I recently, um, last year, appointed our first senior curator for cross-disciplinary platforms who's a, a really dynamic um, curator who has worked in performing arts, has worked in film, and can move very, and does move very fluidly across these different platforms that often have you know, different methodologies and evaluative methods, you know, for how, how they work and different timelines for how they work. And he's um, been a very catalytic agent in trying to cross-fertilize the program and really maximize, you know, those opportunities of how we engage artists and how we activate the Walker's um, platform. And likewise, we've been inviting artists that we have a, a, a history with, like Ralph Lemon, who's actually from, he grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, with um, the Walker as an important um, 
uh, foundational experience for him um, to help us think about what it means to collect performance. And he, in fact, is now producing a book that will be available soon called On Value that comes out of some of these investigations with the Walker of creating um, a work for the galleries for stage and to talk about you know, the process of how one collects performance, how one values it, and how one values and documents the, the lived experience. And this is, I showed this slide earlier of a project he did this past September where he took over a gallery for um, almost a period of a month and staged what he described as a lecture performance musical that took many different forms and manifestations in the galleries, um, both more traditional performance, but also per small performative vignettes that would happen throughout the day and in the galleries, um, uh, and now is uh, being evolved into um, more of an installation or video-based um, kind of residue that comes out of this investigation. And we've similarly asked Sarah Mitchelson to help us think institutionally about what it means to work in these ways and to collect in these ways. And so she is going to be um, presenting a new work uh, in September. But we're also building and shaping a, a conference around um, performance in museums that will revolve around um, her, her presence at the institution. So inviting artists to, to help us think about how we become a more supple institution. And just to say that we're not just interested in experimenting you know, solely um, in the physical spaces of the institution, but we've really looked at uh, our virtual platforms as another space to commission artists and to work with artists. And if you haven't um, gone onto the Walker website, I, I urge you to take a look. A couple of years ago, we shifted um, the website's focus from being just a way to access our programs and to be ways to find out about what, what's on um, at the Walker, and really uh, reimagined it as more of a journalistic platform where we author content, we invite others to review our work, uh, we aggregate uh, relevant news articles from the day from other publications that contextualize the artists that we're presenting or continue to track artists that have been um, at, the, at the Walker. Uh, and so it, it in many ways is a, a, a kind of a prototype of the kind of uh, totally interdisciplinary institution that um, we're, we're aspiring to be. And uh, apart from being a kind of new platform for scholarship in a time when art criticism is not, you know, in its kind of strongest um, form, particularly in, in, in print media, it's become a, an incredible way to also reveal to audiences some of the, or to demystify the institution and to share the kind of research and and work that we do um, with artists and how we think about um, our work as, as an institution. And very recently, uh, we started to also begin to curate content in different ways and to give artists platforms to also express themselves in different ways and not just about the work that they make, but about current events. And so we launched, our web editor launched um, an artist op-ed series a couple of years ago, um, or I guess about a year and a half ago. Um, where we've invited artists that we've worked with in different parts of our program to um, write a, an essay um, or give, give reflections on recent events. So artist Dred Scott, who was in the Radical Presence Black Performance and Contemporary Art Exhibition, uh, just in the weeks after Ferguson um, authored a piece. Um, Ana Tiju, um, a Chilean hip-hop artist, um, talked about kind of violence against the female body. Artist uh, James Bridal, who also writes for The Guardian and writes a lot about um, kind of freedom in, kind of with, in the face of new technologies, um, to talk about um, what, what, it, what citizenship means in, in sort of today's um, world. So an interesting al alternative platform for artists to um, be responsive not just to, to art, but to the world in which we live. And we are just uh, doing this May. Uh, uh, a journalism conference um, that called Superscript that is specifically, you know, trying to bring together thinkers about what arts journalism and criticism have become um, in the, in this digital age. And uh, here are um, some outlines of some of the, of the panels. I think some of it might be webcast. If you're interested, um, please go on our website and and learn more about the Superscript con conference, which we're very excited to be organizing at the Walker. And then just to um, 
maybe end with uh, something I'm very excited about that we're um, about to launch at the Walker just in a week. So you're getting a bit of a preview on a new project that you can't quite yet find um, on our website. And it's a wonderfully inventive and experimental um, project that I think is uh, very much an interdisciplinary collaboration that exists and will exist solely on the web. And it was spearheaded by our director of our design studio, Emmett Byrne, and our store manager, um, who uh, Michelle Tobin, who I think taken this cross-disciplinary mandate, you know, to uh, kind of almost new heights. And what they've done is that they've engaged about 20 artists who've worked with the Walker in some way, visual artists, filmmakers, graphic designers, architects, um, composers, and about 20 of them, and invited them to help them create an intangible museum. So this is an online collection of art objects that have no physical form. And they, the, these intangible objects will be um, exchanged, purchased, sold on the Walker's website, the shop, museum shop website, um, and sold along other tangible objects. So you're seeing what, what, what the web page um, will look like. And what some of these intangible objects are are scores, their conversations, might be digital renderings, experience and services that kind of offer direct but limited access to um, a number of the artists who are involved in the project. And I think, you know, one of the reasons they became interested in doing this is that, you know, artists are, like, like designers, are always um, negotiating their negotiating space, both with audience, with their practice, and with new economies, and, and in this case, new technology. And I think it also is focused on, you know, what these new um, transaction logics on, on the internet are. So there's been a, a lot of um, conversation um, about, you know, how one values these pieces, what the pricing structure is, and the artists are incredibly kind of engaged in trying to design and shape for this context of what it means to produce in this context and, and how that changes sort of all our, our understandings of how things are valued and exchanged. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about this because I think it brings together a variety of creative thinkers across disciplines to ask questions about artistic production, about new economies, about value, about exchange, about audience, um, and I'm especially excited that it comes from our graphic design, you know, department and our, our store manager, who's been really game to sort of deal with these complexities. And I think it does what I think the Walker can and should do best, which is to catalyze inquiry and discovery about the world in which we live, and to engage curators and artists and the public um, in these questions, in questions that, again, going back to the mission statement, the questions that sort of shape and inspire us um, as, as individuals, as cultures and communities. And actually, I should show you, so I'll give you uh, just a taste. Um, so this is one of the intangibles by Nico Mulli, who's an American composer, classical composer, who's um, also incredibly um, experimental. So he uh, is designing a limited edition ringtones so 30 ringtones that um, if you purchase it, you have a conversation with him and he will design a ringtone specifically for you um, in response to that conversation and what uh, his engagement um, with you is. This is a Greek um, theoretical architect who's very interested in um, Second Life, which is um, kind of a virtual um, platform where you can buy real estate and he's, you know, it's a kind of Second Life has been around a long time, no one goes on it anymore and, and he's, kind of interested in how it's become this completely like desolate, isolated place. And so he's created these, these viewing platforms or isolation platforms where you can contemplate, you know, that sort of sense of, uh, of isolation. And so this one's presented really interesting challenges for our store manager because this has to be exchanged in Linden dollars, which is the currency of Second Life, and our accountant's trying to figure out how to, <laughs> to, to manage that. Or... Um, Rolu, which is a design collective in, in the Twin Cities, has designed an exhibition that exists only as a zip file that you can present on your laptop, in your house, in a gallery. Um, it's meant to be a, an exhibition uh, that can be presented and adapted in, in any number of contexts and uh, takes as its inspiration the Walker's artist book collection, which has been a source of inspiration to him for a long time. Local choreographers body cartography are very interested in, in exploring the subject of 
kinesthetic empathy, and so they're interested in engaging directly with audiences in their performance. So if you purchase one of their um, uh, encounters or experiences, you, you would need to show up in Minneapolis on a designated site and they will perform for you and with you uh, for a 15 minute period. You can purchase an additional 15 minutes. Um, but uh, so it gives you an idea of how um, many of the artists are approaching this is, I think, a really interesting creative platform and again asks all these questions about um, exchange and interaction and how we negotiate space, not just public space, but um, this virtual space, which again, um, I'll go skip that one and just go again right back, um, you know, to the to the Walker's mission statement because I think it is what drives us that sort of act of of questioning, um, just as it did 75 years ago. It continues, I think, to again inspire us to question everything and to not always have all the answers and to take us, you know, where the questions lead us. And I think the Intangibles Project really reflects and embodies all of that um, aspect of being a catalytic um, platform and activating the different platforms that the institution has to explore these questions, not just as artists, but also as active audience members. And so, again, I think, um, again, that's one of the things that inspires me the most is about that active, active questioning. And I think it is that creative agency um, that can be so powerful um, and I think communicate to audiences of why art matters and why art is important in society and how it inspires us to really reflect on our world. So thank you. Thank you for listening uh, to the Walker. I hope you'll come visit, come to Minneapolis, um, and uh, watch us online. You can see a lot of our lectures online too. Thank you. Are we sitting? Okay. Okay. So this is where we do a little bit of a Q&A and then we'll throw it open to the audience for further questions. I think we've really had a great invitation to, to question everything. Um, and I think the, the breadth of work that you've been doing at the Walker is uh, absolutely staggering. And I wanted to really begin by asking you what limits you see to the platforms of engagement. So you've talked a little bit, or quite a lot, about um, this move from multidisciplinary to cross-disciplinary practices. And you've talked a lot, you've shown many concrete examples of how the Walker is a, a platform that engages with community, engages with artists, not just in the, the local context, but uh, across uh, all of the US and indeed across the world. So could you talk a little bit more about how you see that idea of, of the platform? Um, I was talking with one of the um, curatorial seminars um, today kind of about this question. Um, you know, I think in, in many ways, some of the biggest challenges that institutions have, and not just the walker today, is the physical space. So um, the physical space, which in many instances was designed, could have been designed 100 years earlier, was designed to support a different kind of programmatic and value system. And so um, while the I think the website, and I said this earlier, I think the website models the kind of uh, interdisciplinarity that we're aspiring to, but if you visit the Walker, you might not quite have the, the same experience because the spaces are, the theater is a separate space, the galleries are a separate space, the cinema is a separate space, they're not always activated. Um, but we've been trying to um, kind of again activate public space actually in, in a way that allow, where we can be more experimental in do more pop-up kinds of performative events and engage the public in different ways. But I think the, the physicality and structure of the, the museum sometimes limits that, that ability to be flexible and informal. And I think not just in the work that we do, but also even how audiences read and understand those spaces or expect to behave you know, in those spaces. There are certain norms that are how you experience theater or that you don't speak in the galleries, you know, all these things shape also how audiences experience that. So I think we have that challenge of making artists, the audience is comfortable and 
maybe uh, acting in different ways, the staff to maybe uh, try to shape different kinds of experiences, and of course artists who are pushing us to do it, who don't yeah. see these boundaries. And I would say I think artists in many ways are are the bravest in transcending those boundaries, you know, for the public and reminding us that sometimes the public doesn't care about those boundaries. We sort of have three different architectures, don't we? So we have the architecture which we're sitting in, so the, the theatrical, um, the museum, uh, somewhere for performing arts. Then you've got the, the architecture of the institution um, and then you've got the architecture of the intangibles now. Um, how do you see those things in, into interacting and what are the challenges that you face uh, and your team face in moving in and out of those different spaces? I think, I think these kinds of experiments, I think the intangibles experiment and other experiments that we do, whether they succeed or fail, uh, they allow, they kind of embolden one to experiment differently and also to realize that you know, the artists are very willing to go there. The audience is sometimes even more willing to go there. And so it, I think it em kind of emboldens us to, to be more experimental. But I think the kind of a willingness to, to risk is sometimes the hardest thing to do, and particularly in resource constrained, you know, nonprofits, you know, where. So I forgot you, the first part of your question, but so if, <laughs> if, if you're used to if you're used to curating and showing work, um, let's say moving image work, and it has to be in a yeah. theatre like this, what happens when you start to commission artists to do work, and they say, hey, I don't want to show the work here, I want to show it differently? How does that work institutionally for you? Yeah, so we, we have those conversations. I mean, we always want to present the work with the greatest uh, respect to the artist and to the artist's intent. And so we're not going to, you know, take undue liberty unless, you know, the artists are, are open to that. And sometimes that takes a lot of conversation and negotiation um, also with, with staff when you work across platform. Um, and, you know, one has to be willing to have those conversations and, and kind of work through and adapt. Um, I'll give you an example um, that I shared earlier with um, the staff here. Um, in fact, John, John Waters is a, a, a filmmaker, theater artist, ve very interdisciplinary artist that has a long history with the Walker, and we invited him to work with the Walker's collection. And uh, he did a very unconventional um, installation, uh, not just in the galleries, but actually throughout the entire part of the museum. And so that required an, uh, 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 an, an, an public space. So it required a lot of conversations with our registrars, with the visitor service staff, with security, and people had, or the staff had to uh, kind of adapt and negotiate certain things that weren't negotiable because they involve the safety of artwork, they involve the safety of the public. So there are conversations and negotiations, but I think disrupting some of those institutional norms, which sometimes are strongly held that maybe need to shift, is, you know, is part of this, this process, so being open to those questions and trying to find different answers. You, you mentioned how there's been this, this shift um, in, in the way in which we can distribute artworks and we can engage with wider publics, um, largely over the web um, and through digitization and so on. That's often a, a vexing question for institutions, especially when you're trying to work out the the points where you are documenting, where you're collecting, and then what is the work that you can show, what is the work that is um, uh, available for research and so on. Have you got a, a, a way of, of dealing with all of those sorts of differences? Yeah, but I think each it becomes a, 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 new, a new situation. And again, sometimes it has to come out of long conversation. When we acquired Ralph Lemon's um, film installation, uh, he first did it as part of a stage production at the Walker. So he did the stage production on Saturday night and on Sunday he asked us to open the theater and present this film installation that was an all day long piece. And so as we sat there and looked at this new work, I asked him, is this, is this act two of the stage production or does this, is this a work that could live in a different context? Could this be translated into the museum? Could this could this live elsewhere, or is this just part of the live experience? And you know, and he looked at me really honestly, and he said, Olga, I don't know. I don't know yet. And it took a year and a half of conversation with him for him to 
ultimately decide that it was an independent work that could be presented in a variety of contexts. So sometimes the answer isn't immediately, you know, available, um, and one has to have that conversation about intent and and process. Um, and we do that with our, our collection all the time, um, particularly with film works and performing based works. There's all kinds of rights issues that have to be navigated and sometimes the rights can be negotiated and sometimes not and we respect that and, um, and try to offer you know, different alternatives to that. We've been working very hard actually um, with a lot of our film collection to go back and negotiate rights, presentation rights for different platforms. Um, supported by a grant that's allowed us to do both preservation work but also clear the rights, which is much more complex in, 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 in film you know, than in others. We, we collect our performing arts commissions, but we don't own the rights to restage them. Um, but yet the archive, the documentation of those is important to us and we archive that, so that's considered a special collection, but we, don't, we can't restage those. And with Merce Cunningham, we can't restage, the, the Merce Cunningham Trust retains that, but what we, we have are the, the objects that are in some cases ephemera, in some cases independent objects, and how one presents those responsibly in, in explaining what they are, I think is, you know, is a rigorous, thoughtful process that, that we work hard, you know, to, again, always going back to the artist's intent and to try to, res to present the work with the greatest amount of respect and integrity for how the artist would, would want it. One of the things that struck me as I was looking at your presentation is that really there are three different stages of evolution of the Walker. So from this private 19th century collection through to the, in a sense it's almost a white, it's a white cube, but a, a different sort of white cube because from its earliest it's already engaging with a different kind of practice, a different model of the museum, and then um, your, your current phase. Um, how do you see that developing into what might be the fourth phase? Where, where, where can you take all of this? And, and uh, is there something that's emerging for you as um, a, a model that works in the 21st century? So, and I'm thinking particularly about the way that you've described the work that you do as being beyond just the, the borders of the, the centre itself, and that it permeates out into these different practices and different regions. Can you talk about that a little bit more? So, I mean, I think the Walker as an institution has kind of reimagined itself to twice in its history. So Mr. Walker's collection, none of it really exists anymore in the Walker's um, collection or a few um, kind of historical portraits of, of Mr. Walker and such that, that um, remain. But as the community grew and evolved and changed and other institutions came into the city, you know, the Walker's focus became decidedly more contemporary and multidisciplinary. And so I, I, and the Walker family is still involved as, you know, the founding benefactor's family is now, what, four, five generations or, you know, uh, removed, but really support, have supported that evolution in interesting ways. And I think what the next evolution is, I think is, um, you know, certainly it's something that's on my mind, um, you know, all the time. I think that uh, the kind of, collecting practices in terms of working with artists not just to document their works but to really engage with artists in conversations about how to think about their works across platform is something that um, I think is, is important for us you know to do and there's a role there that we can can provide that other institutions maybe can't um, and I would say also um, the kind of scholarship we produce so our exhibitions program, you know, exhibitions produce catalogs. You know, it's it. We produce scholarship in, you know, in a in a very formal way. For our performing arts program and film program, these tend to be much more presentational programs where it's about commissioning and presenting new work. But we don't publish catalogs around performance or necessarily about film. And so that's something that we've been talking a lot about in uh, generating new platforms for scholarship, publishing more about these other program areas, um, both online. Um, and in print. So I see these as, as a, a real areas um, of growth um, where I think we can be um, not just, you know, an institution that presents this, this work and collects this kind of work, but also a kind of research hub in ways that, that, that perhaps other institutions can't in terms of these intersections between disciplines.
I mean, it's, it's very clear that the walker is part of the production of, of new knowledge, and I think you've given us many great examples of that today and the, the, the quality of the scholarship and um, the directions that you're moving. How does that fit in the, the wider context of art centres around the world and the role of the museum in the production of knowledge? Do you see that as something which is absolutely essential and that that's something that will develop or, or that's something that's idiosyncratic to uh, the walker? I think it's been idiosyncratic to the walker, although there are, uh, there are other institutions that do work this way, a number of them within university or more of a research-based context. We, we're not part of a, 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 a university system. Um, but I think that you know artists um, are producing um, in ways that kind of go beyond the traditional institutional models. So I think that's why you see museums trying to, you know, dynamize, you know, their programs and spaces and work in new ways. Um, because the, you know, the, the we need to make the platforms more s supple and responsive. You know, I think artists are off working outside of institutions because institutions sometimes become too formal a venue. So I think we have the advantage of having a different platform and I think many, many museums are trying to offer a wider spectrum of, of platforms. So I see maybe m more movement towards being the kind of institution that we are. We just have a history of doing it and a, a kind of collection that can encapsulate that. Um, you know, and I think one of the things that MoMA uses is atrium space yep. for this. It's, it's not a formal theatrical space. And, you know, one of the challenges they have is, you know, turning a, essentially a kind of gallery or public space over to performance. And uh, it's not that we don't do that, but we uh, we have a formal theater stage and an ability to stage a different level, you know, of production. And so I think that's a challenge for museums as they try to move into these other arenas, or using a space like this to show film as opposed to a real um, cinema space. So again, going back to the space, the limitations of the space. Yeah, fantastic. So I think there's a roving mic as well. So if if members of the audience have questions, um, I'd be delighted to throw. I think our first one is just down here. Uh, you certainly have an impressive array of um, the new media and the cross-disciplinary arts and everything. I'd like to go back to the 1930s maybe a little bit. Uh, a year and a half ago, I saw this fantastic exhibition uh, in New York at the Whitney. and. Um, it actually traveled to three or four institutions, and your institution was one of it. Um, Edward Hopper Drawing. And uh, that sort of triggered off in my mind that your, your location is the Midwest. The Midwest is known as the breadbasket of America. Uh, Paul Bunyan, all the beautiful sort of roadside big sculptures that uh, Minnesota has and the WPA and that whole sort of um, tradition of the 30s and the 40s and the regional artists, how much of that is still part of the Walker? It's, there's, a sh there's a show right now that looks at that beginning history. <clears throat> so it's when the Walker started to collect was in 1942 after it became an art center to collect outside of TV Walker's collection, but it never really collected a lot of WPA era work that was collected by another institution in town, um, the University Museum, the Wiseman Art Museum. So there's the, the collection really begins with 1911 with the Franz Mark painting, the Edward Hopper painting was the second work to be acquired um, into the collection, and so a kind of smattering of American and European things form the foundation of the collection, but the, the collection then really starts in the late 50s and, and kind of goes forward after that. But I think that that's not to, even though it's not reflected in the collection, it's not to diminish the importance of that WPA era foundation, because I think it did. There was a very visionary, the first director of the Walker was, um, a w, was working for the WPA in Washington, he was an architect, not an art historian. Very charismatic, very much populist, you know, who really, really forged the vision of the institution as this meeting place for the arts that could bring all these disciplines together. And he showed Maya Darren's films in 1948, you know, in, at the Walker as kind of an experimental filmmaker. He's showing film as an independent genre in the 1940s. I mean, it was, it's kind of amazing history. 
Um, so that, the, that, that WPA spirit, you know, and, and also of wanting to um, kind of introduce audiences to the power of art. The first acquisition was Franz Marc's Blue Horses, a 1911 painting. Real incredible masterwork, but one of the reasons it was, it was collected, not just because it was a great modernist work, but Daniel Deffenbacher, the first director, was interested in forging a dialogue about censorship of the arts because this is an artist who had been included in Nazi Germany's degenerate art exhibition. And so a really bold gesture for a small Midwestern institution to kind of its opening gesture as a collecting institution outside of this 19th century collection was not just to create, to collect modernist work, but to create works that would forge a discussion about the value of art in society, about artistic censorship, not being afraid of controversy. I mean, that totally underscores the Walker's sort of values as an institution of not being afraid to take risks, to really support artistic freedom. So um, interesting, those WPA roots really formed, I think, the institution in profound ways. And you know, the, the Walker was one of about 70 art centers that were created around the US as part of the WPA movement. Incredible moment in kind of a, American history and American culture that sadly isn't supported in that way um, anymore. Um, but it, it's a good touchstone to that moment. Are there, yeah, I think there's a question up the back there. Just while we're waiting, can you, can you just tell us a little bit about um, the support for the Walker? So you've just talked about its inauguration. Um, and yeah, ha what's the funding structure? How do you, how do you um, manage financially? Sure, and just to say that the, the, when the art center, when the um, WPA took over, the way that they would start an art center is they'd offer to pay for the staffing. And so I think their contribution was $35,000. And the city of Minneapolis had to raise $5,500 in the match to, to, to uh, enact that contribution. And so um, the, found, the first uh, sort of fundraising brochure were selling dollar memberships to raise the, so 5,500 people contributed a dollar to create the art center. The WPA supported it for four years and then pulled out because uh, a lot of the WPA programs closed at that, at that time. But, it, but it, it sustained, it catalyzed something within the community. And so we, uh, I, when I worked at the Smithsonian, it's a, a maybe not unlike um, here in Australia, where you know it's it's a government-funded institution where about half the support is um, government funds and the rest is private monies. In the case of the Walker, I mean, there's no um, there's no federal support, there's no city support, there's a small small percentage of state support. So it's all it's through endowment. So a third of our um, um, operations is supported by an endowment, and for a contemporary art institution, that's it's rare to to have a kind of endowment. And a lot of our founding donors of our, our of our board, which really formalized in the '60s, created the endowment as a way, a kind of almost like an R and D fund, to give the Walker the kind of freedom to do very experimental programming that wouldn't be you know censored or impacted by by any kind of um, kind of government in influence. Um, the rest is, pre is foundation and corporate support, um, and private individuals are the largest percentage of, of um, sor sources, and also selling admissions, ticket sales, fundraisers, you know, all these, all these things um, support, you know, what is, what for us is a $22 million um, dollar budget a year to support the programs and operations of, of the Walker. Fantastic. So it's a lot of fundraising. It is. That's the job and of a director. So, <laughs> <laughs> so up the, I have up the, the mic here. Yep. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how the Walker programmatically engages with the local community. Yeah, a variety, variety of different um, ways. Um, we have, um, you know, programs for all ages. Uh, um, you know, a range of public programs uh, as well as youth programs and our teen program is is very active, but I would say the way that we really engage the, the closest with the community is we, we partner with many, many organizations, um, whether they're smaller arts organizations, uh, the universities, um, other, other cultural partners, um, and we, we program and, and, and market together. Uh, and you know, you know I, I'd say try to activate all the platforms of the Walker. The Sculpture Garden is a real 
asset in terms of engaging a broader general audience. And we do a lot of programming in the summers in the garden and on our uh, green, four acre green space that we have on our site. Uh, we've used it as this experimental platform for not only our staff to curate programs there, but to invite a lot of our partners to program and curate and activate um, those spaces. I think we also take a really strong role in being a great civic partner. So we're engaged in a lot of uh, city urban planning. The park system invited us to help them think about the future of the park system in Minneapolis. And we organized a series of lectures and programs and helped design you know, a whole commissioning process um, and a whole communal process um, around that. So um, we're part of a larger arts district and do a lot of um, engagement that way and participate in citywide festivals um, that also bring you know new audiences so we each program area has its its array of public engagement and then institutionally we do um, an array of public engagement great i think there's a, another question up the back yeah we'll just take one more question here um thank you um thank you for the talk um yeah it's uh, it's, it's true that the performance in a performance art is is emerging and since um, the work art center is particularly designed for display that kind of artwork, I mean, uh, multi or cross disciplinary artwork. Uh, but I have a question about that is um, how do you sell them? Excuse me? How do you sell performance art? How do you sell performance art? art? Yeah, well, we don't, we don't sell. So we, we're not a commercial um, space, we're really a, a nonprofit presentation space so we 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 invest in production and support the often you know give artists funds to present the work and produce the work so we we participate in in the in the production and sometimes we may purchase or acquire you know work um, although we don't really acquire performance but we may invest in it and we don't we don't sell work Good work to the public uh, then where do you get money from? Um, through uh, individual donations, a board of trustee and donors, corporations, foundations, um, ticket sales, um, all kinds of events in our endowment. Mm. So multiple funding sources. So th I think we probably have time for one more question if people are uh, wanting to ask. But while you're getting your question ready, I have a rather mischievous question. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought I'd save till the end. So you've, you've talked about how you're moving towards this multidisciplinary practice. How does that work when you're commissioning work? Um, and do you have um, difficulties across the different departments within Walker? So often we find um, many institutions, when we are in our disciplines, when we then are asked to work in a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary way, we all say, yeah, it's great, but then something happens when we actually try and do it. How are you doing with that? <laughs> uh, it's kind of like the building architecture. Sometimes that's, you know, sometimes the systems are a challenge. It's like kind of intellectually, conceptually, everybody's game to do it, but sometimes it gets challenging in the mechanics. So, you know, if an artist starts invited by the visual arts program and wants to produce a piece on stage, there has to be time to do that. And then there becomes, there's a budget discussion, a negotiation between departments offering funds. So sometimes these programs happen um, because different departments and program areas pool funds to support them. And I would say when the artist asks, it tends to happen much more easily than when another curator or the director asks. Um, so, um, so if the I artist mean, asks, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, but part of one of the things that you and I were talking about before is that in many ways, our um, how we budget and plan our our resource spending throughout the year, in some ways, is one of our biggest challenges or limitations. Are restructuring how we do this? So, one of the ways we're doing that is saying that we are we are trying to do an interdisciplinary residency every year where we're, we're allocating resources outside of individual program budgets to support you know, that kind of activity so that the staff doesn't have to engage in those negotiations and just support yeah, right. But if, but if you didn't have the artists going to your your book sales and your design <laughs> team going, hey, what about this idea of doing some in intangibles, then you may not innovate or you might not have right. that um, 
expansion in in that sense would that be right yeah but and, and i think uh again to not to un overstate the whole aspect of the mission statement but um i think one of the things that imp impressed me the most about the walker and the walker staff when i first came to minneapolis is how deeply held that mission is by every sector of the organization whether it's the shop manager it's the guard staff you know, it's the visitor services staff, um, you know, the educate. It's, it's so widely held. And so, you know, uh, staff is just, there's an ethos at the Walker that I, you know, I can't, I don't take responsibility for. It was modeled by my predecessors, you know, from decades ago of being this artist-centric institution that is there to support, you know, that creativity. And if sometimes that means working outside of your comfort zone. And so we try to support that. So there's a, there is an institutional ethos that supports kind of going there. Fantastic. Well, I think that's a great point to end it on. Oh, we have one more question. Uh, Last question. Sorry, it's a very quick question. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. I just wanted to ask how you see yourself as part of the identity of the city that you're in. Um, you mentioned sort of that you connect that the, the parklands around your site are, you know, a source of great enjoyment for many people, but are you sort of p part of the fabric of the city and how that kind of is imagined? Yeah, I, I think we very much are and have been historically, although I think there are times when um, the institution has been read or seen as being less accessible to the local community than others, and I think that's just something that all contemporary institutions, you know, have that challenge, is, is you sometimes present works that are difficult and challenging and may not be appealed to a broader audience in, in quite the same way. Um, but, you know, I, for me it's really important that we're not just an institution that happens to be in Minneapolis or is adjacent to the community, but that we are very much embedded, you know, in the community. And uh, that's why our engagement in a lot of these civic projects is really important because it, it gives us an ability, you know, to engage very visibly. I'm very active, you know, uh, you know, within the kind of larger kind of community, you know, kind of urban leaders in the in the city, and I think that's really important. And I think because of our design program and our design history, I think uh, institutions, and I would say also not just uh, you know, kind of the government and city entities. But corporations and, and other organizations see us as a place that is about experimentation. So a lot of companies will come and do their strategic planning at the Walker and design experiences going through the galleries or engaging with curators. So kind of people see us as a design lab. And so in, and what's great is in thinking about the city and thinking about the future of the city that you know we're seen as someone who should be in that conversation um, is really important. And so you know it's about our, you know, our staff being very visible. I mean, I, I, the thing I take great pride in is that many of our staff across, you know, the institution serve on many boards uh, for uh, large and small organizations um, around the city. So the, the presence of the Walker isn't just the institution, but it's also, you know, the staff members and those who engage with the institution that are kind of out there and visible and helping shape, you know, the, what the city is evolving into. Fantastic. So thank you very much, Olga Visa. Thank you all.